Greetings, and welcome to the Open-Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland, and I'm your host. Today on our podcast, I will be sharing some highlights from an interview I did in August last year with the magical, hardworking, and omniscient Karen Kay, more commonly known as the Fairy Lady. Karen is a former BBC News Editor who founded her own international fairy magazine called Fay, F-A-E, Fay Magazine to be precise. Her fairy journey began in her grandmother's garden where she used to make fairy perfume as a young girl. Karen is also related to renowned fairy poet Walter Delamere. To find out more about this amazing lady, check out her website www karenk.co.uk Now, I hope you enjoy our highlights. Do you ever go out looking for the Fae? And have you come up with, like I even came up with an acronym for you, the Fizz. A fairy investigation squad. Oh, have I you, like that. Yeah, have you ever done that? Have you ever gone on an investigation in search of day? Okay, so in general, no, but actually, yes. Uh, oh. My partner and I did that once uh, because he he's he's very supportive in in my work, and um, and he said, you know, okay, so midsummer's the time when we go and see fair, you know, you're supposed to go fairy spotting and, you know, look at according to all the books and everything. So we set off one, uh, I think it was like a, as the sun was going down on, on midsummer's day, it was quite a number of years ago. And we went into a field with the intention of fairy spotting. And then as the sun was starting to set, it was still light all of these tiny little fairies just flew up and we both saw it with our own eyes and we both just stood there because we didn't really expect to be <laughs> to be seeing them and we're like are they insects are they but we hadn't not seen anything like that before um so i was like do you believe now and he's like yeah and then after this time faded the mind comes in and it's like oh but was it and you know it, it gets questioned whereas I never question it um and I, I don't go out on fairy investigations you know like that uh but that's quite a good idea that might be quite a fun thing to do if you could add it to like if you were doing a weekend um conference or maybe not a conference a festival you could yeah. have it as nighttime event you know yeah fairy like, spotting yeah definitely <laughs> I love the idea of that So, um, obviously, there are many kinds of day out there. Uh, would you mind describing to our listeners just a few of the more prominent groupings? Yeah, okay. And immediately, as, as you said that, gnomes have popped into my mind. I so, love gnomes. I, just, um, oh, I can't believe I'm telling you this. I have <laughs> at least 30 gnomes in my garden. I have that, a gnome fetish. No, for actual gnome energy no actual like gnome you know that her painted figurines paint. yeah 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 well that um you, you know what um what? Part of, i won't again it's so easy to digress in, in this but um <laughs> when you have gnome figurines or gnome statues in your garden mm -hmm. that is a big sign it's like a welcome sign to the fairies and the gnomes to say you are welcome here i acknowledge you so on some level by having those you you are actually welcoming them inviting them into your garden so and gnomes are very very earthy they're they're manifestors they're hard workers and they will be attracted to people who have those same kind of qualities so and or if you need to enhance those qualities within yourself then call on the gnomes because they will help oh, they're cool. very hard working they're very 
very very earthbound so they wouldn't really fly as the other fairies would with wings that they're, they're working fairies so they reside in very close to the earth around roots of trees around trees in dark bushes and things like this um so yeah no, gnomes are great to work with they're good manifestors as well if you ever need to manifest something in your life as long as it's not for selfish reasons you know it might be something that you need on a practical level they're very practical beings and and sometimes you might need money for practical purposes so you can always ask they won't always help and because they will feel your intention and your motives behind your requests that you can work with them energetically and the way to welcome them into your life is to put statues in your garden so you're halfway there Sharon <laughs> well, it, it's it's actually quite a funny story um I just fell in love I've always had gnomes in my you know my front door or my back door and stuff like that I just grew up with them as a kid and then um we started giving them I have two daughters. We started actually, whoever's birthday it was, got a gnome. And we, we, we all, it got to the point where they started getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the last birthday. We had to stop doing it because um, we had this, it's a good, it's almost five foot tall gnome. Oh, wow. I want I've, one. I've got to show you, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a photo of it. It's just hilarious. But it was so, it, we couldn't even wrap the sucker. It was so big. <laughs> it was so we have we've actually we've moved on to meerkats now <laughs> <laughs> that is an interesting um transition <laughs> yeah, we, well we, we tried pug dogs but it just didn't have the same feel and i must admit we i've actually i actually just bought another couple of gnomes like two days ago yeah i was gonna say the gnomes won't go away for long <laughs> no no they, they're back and um it's quite funny there's some more more variety of the gnome statues as well there's some really fun ones like i've got a golden gnome i've got a mermaid gnome half gnome half mermaid i've got um a meditating gnome i've got um a spock captain's no dr spock from star trek gnome um i've got loads of crazy gnomes i love them so much <laughs> i really love working with gnome energy and they help me to work as well they really will encourage you. So that's just one type of, uh, you know, being from fairyland, a gnome. And then, oh, gosh, what have you got? In Cornwall, for example, oh, they're still a kind of gnome. <laughs> Actually, I can't get away from the gnomes. Yeah. Is the, the knockers. They're called the knockers, K-N-O-C-K-E-R-S. And they are um, fairies like gnome type creatures that live in the mines and um that they're, they're not as many there are not of, as many of them nowadays because the the mines aren't actually actively used now as much as they were so for the tin mines and they would work very closely with the miners and and if there was danger or you know something that wasn't quite right they would knock hence their name the knockers so but they are a form of gnome as well. They live underground and are associated with, with mining and they're very specific to Cornwall. Uh, I think other mining areas would have them as well, but they probably have different names. Um, and then there are the Moor men, and these are specifically associated to the area you know of, of Cornwall but again I think you'd find them anywhere and they would be fairies of the moors that would be protectors of the animals the cattle the horses the wild ponies this sort of thing the sheep <laughs> uh, so they're specifically there for the animals and they they they're described as very tall thin and they're called more men but you would get female versions as well uh mm -hmm. And they are protectors of animals. So if you, you know, if you've got a poorly pet or something, yeah, take them to the vet, of course. But you can also work with the more men and the more women to to bring extra fairy healing energy to to help to heal your pet. So that that's something to, you know, not a lot of people know about those. Um, and you've got 
Sylphs, S Y L P H S, who are fairies. You know, they they would be when you think of a fairy, or when most people think of a fairy, they say, "Oh, a little gossamer fairy with wings," and blah blah blah, and that's how a kind of sylph would manifest very often. And they are fairies of the air, so they help to purify the air. They're present in all types of weather. You can call on them if you need to influence the weather, which I I don't really recommend, but maybe you're going out, you've got plans to go out for a nice picnic and you'd like it to stay nice, then you can ask them. You know, they don't always fulfill wishes and requests but sometimes they do they can be quite nice um and i work with them a lot with our festival and more often than not over the last three years i think we've had excellent weather and we get a little bit of rain on the last day and that's fine because that's when everyone's going so um yeah so you can work with them and and they're very sensitive to frequencies like all the wi-fi mobile phones you know telephone masks it it does it it's not um pleasant for them so that can actually push them away so when you are trying to connect with them if you do want to then i would always say you know switch off your mobile phone put it into airplane mode or something like this and and just be mindful of that because they're they are very sensible sensitive to those signals and frequencies what would be like the strangest story you've ever heard that might be related to the bay something that maybe we haven't heard before about them Oh, gosh. Well, I I don't know what you would have heard or what you wouldn't have heard. But one of the interesting stories that has come up recently is about Reverend Kirk. Have you heard of him? He's he was from Scotland Mm -hmm. and he he was a a pastor, you know, a, a, a man of the cloth, if you like. And he did lots of research on fairies and the little folk and when he did it, it it wasn't it was kind of shunned upon in those days especially from a religious point of view because yeah. fairies have been kind of demonized by a lot of religions they have, so yeah. for, for him to actually go out and seek that contact and then it the story goes that he he was taken away he was abducted by the fairies and um I don't have the full I wish I'd had it in front of me but it's easy to research if if you know it's easy to google but basically he was taken away abducted by the fairies and put in a tree his soul was put in a tree apparently um he was found dead his physical body was found dead but actually he his soul still alive So, um, Karen, do you see the yes. original fairy tales as kind of historical documents that should be revered akin to, say, a Christian Bible? Um, oh, uh, hmm, that's interesting. I, <laughs> I, I <know>. that's <laughs> a really, in- <laughs> it's kind of thrown me that question. Uh, I think it's because you said the Bible in there as well. So I've, I've never associated, um, I don't. I think with fairy tales, there are usually very strong messages, very strong lessons. If you look beyond the actual story and look at the essence of what it's saying, um, it's I like terrible. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I would never. I couldn't, with my hand on my heart, say, "Oh, they should be revered like a." a bible or anything like that um i i think you can get some very powerful life lessons from fairy tales when you when you really look into them uh i get sent lots of books 
as as the editor of, of the fairy magazine as Fay magazine i get sent a lot of books and i have got some that i haven't got around to reading yet that talk exactly about this um not the bible part but the part of the, the stories behind the stories if you like so w- what is the real meaning and why what does it mean really going into it and the psychology of it so that's something perhaps we can talk about in the future as we go more in depth with it but yeah there are definitely strong moral lessons within fairy tales strong life lessons within them that we can take on board and incorporate into our daily lives and and our daily living i i haven't read the bible i've read bits and bobs of the bible so i i can't make that um comparison yeah i can't make that comparison uh so but but yeah yeah it kind of struck me that way when um i started rereading um some old fairy tales like some original fairy tales not the ones that have been kind of disney-fied yeah um, the original stuff and Mm -hmm. a lot of them you know a lot of people die in those fairy tales have you noticed (laughs) There's a, there's a lot of death going on in fairy tales and there's a lot of kids being taught, you know, you know, you know very harsh lessons too. Um, yeah, they're not gentle, are they? I mean, when pe- people like associate, oh yeah, fairies, la la la, very twee, sparkle, sparkles and stuff. But yeah, there's some major heavy stuff going down, isn't there, in, in some of those fairy tales. Like really scary, really, really scary. And I suppose perhaps they they came from a space of like really wanting to teach children a lesson i don't know uh but yeah some of them are shockingly scary and there is a lot of death and a lot of violence in them as well there's also a lot of magic as well uh you can find that within fairy tales but but i agree that they're quite heavy actually some of them with very very strong warnings as well i I think uh Back in 2006, I was in Switzerland, and I, I can't remember the town I was in, but I was just walking around taking some photos, and and I was drawn to this fountain, and um, so I threw in like a gold coin and made a wish, and then I looked up, and there on top of the fountain in the middle is a gnome eating babies. Um. Right. Okay. I'm. I'm trying to get my head around this one. So, um, and it's the, a fairy tale that was and, very prolific in this area, and um, wow. these threatened their children with being eaten by the gnome if they didn't do things. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the bogeyman, isn't it? Or people have these things that I mean, it's shocking, really, isn't it? How people can do this to their children. I actually stood back because I just thrown in my gold coin. I've made a, I've made a, a nice wish. And then I looked up and there was this horrific thing in the middle. I think I wanted to get my money back. And go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, perhaps there are some gnomes that are partial to children. I, d- I don't know, <laughs> but um, generally, I I don't. I think a lot of gnomes are like vegetarians actually, and a lot of fairy beings would be. I mean, they, they, they don't physically eat things as such, but it would be the essence. A lot of, a lot of superstitions have their roots in the Fae. Would you mind sharing a couple with our readers? I thought, for example, like fairy trees, bad omens, etc., you know they they seem that seems to be the root of things but again it might just be scare tactics on parents i don't know um okay so i recently uh wrote an article about fairy trees so so we can start there there are certain all all trees will have uh, you could call it a dryad a tree spirit a fairy guardian a deva whatever you want to call it there will be an energy looking after that tree certain trees are more notorious and they're known as places where fairies would gather and uh, a few of those would be um, a hawthorn tree for example oak ash Uh, specifically with the hawthorns i'm not sure what it is perhaps it's the beautiful blossom but they're drawn there and they're said to have 
their fairy rings around them. They're, they, you know, they'll join hands and they'll dance around these trees. So it is said that you should never cut a hawthorn tree, um, or you could incur the wrath of the fae. Uh, sometimes, like I've got a hawthorn tree, and sometimes the branches grow over. So you have to really. I would never just go up and snip a little twig or a branch off of a tree. I would always talk to the tree you know maybe two or three days before and say look you know you're growing in this place and I really need it that part of you not to be there may I cut this particular branch uh I promise I'm not going to touch the rest of you and just really explain what you're going to do and that then gives the tree and the spirits of the tree the fairies the opportunity to withdraw the sap from that particular branch to pull it back in to the rest of the tree so that you can safely cut it but you should always ask permission and, and this goes for any tree actually but particularly what you do not want to annoy the fairies i was going to use another word but i'm not sure how how many the <laughs> the age range of the, of the listeners are so you do not want to annoy the fairies and so you would um you know just be very respectful equally there are certain places that you know you, you can use common sense there will be certain places certain areas in all over the world where you know you don't go there after dark or you don't go to that place it's you know the fair the fairies don't want you to go there and that could be like known as a fairy space where they gather and and maybe they don't want humans there understandably you know, sometimes you, it's like you don't always want visitors in your home. So why would they always want visitors in theirs? So those places could have deterrence. You know, maybe you might go there and you might trip up or you might get a bramble caught in your clothing or something like this. Again, if you ask, uh, go go by common sense. I mean, if you feel like, whoa, this feels a bit creepy. I don't want to go there. Then don't go there. I mean, it's kind of common sense, really. But some people aren't in tune with that side of things. So they'll go and they'll barge through this kind of sacred fairy space and they will trip up or they might get lost or they might get brambles on their clothing. Any of these kind of things, you know. Um, so it, it's uh, I don't feel there are any hard and fast rules regarding to this. I think a lot of it is down to pure common sense and trusting your own intuition, intuition and instinct on anything like this. Um, so, yeah, there are certain places that you wouldn't go to, but I, I don't think there's a list of them, so to speak. You might you might find something on Google, perhaps, but it would all be very relevant to your local area where you are. Mm. Exactly. Well, I know that I don't even pick a lemon from my lemon tree unless I ask. I, I learned that years ago. My grandmother taught me that. That's so nice. That That's you working. So you're kind of working in harmony with nature anyway when you do that. Because, and I'm the same, like if you're pulling some fruit off of a tree, you ask, you gently tug it. And if the tree wants to release that fruit, it will. But, you know, if you do it in a sensitive way, you can feel rather than yank it off because it's not ready to release it. Uh, it again, these a lot of these things are really common sense. Like I use, um, I'm a big natural living person, so I, I use lemons to clean a lot of things. So I, I visit my tree a lot. So we have very... We actually have lots of conversations with my lemon tree and I. I love that. And I love that you've got a lemon tree, of course, where we are. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't grow lemons or any kind of citrus because we just, or I was going to say we don't have the weather, but the last few weeks it's settled down now. We've had crazy hot weather, like really, really hot. I literally couldn't leave the, leave the flat where I live because it's been so hot, but it's got back. It's feeling a bit more autumnal now. But, yeah, to have citrus fruit, fruits, oh, that's amazing. I love that. I guess I've got a Tahitian lime next to it and a lemon. And, um, well, I, I grow – my veggie patch has – it's just – actually, it's got a lot more herbs than it has actual vegetables at the moment. I'm not very good at growing vegetables, but I am a, I'm an absolute um, herb grower. I can grow any herb. It's amazing. Mm, mm, that's interesting. I've I've got 
a little um i grow like vegetables and things like kale and a lot of green kind of vegetables on my patio <laughs> i've got raised beds and uh i had a uh, funny funny experience anyway so i've kind of invested quite a lot into getting these raised beds and organic plants so that i can grow them and and then um during this very hot spell that we've recently had i noticed we've got also a buddleia they call it like a butterfly bush i don't know if you have them over there as well but the butterflies they love them and the bees and they're really insect friendly bushes basically with beautiful lilac flowers sometimes they have white flowers on them and i noticed there were so many butterflies and it's not far from where my veg is growing like it's very close actually because this buddleia bush has just grown so high and uh i came back one day and and i noticed this butterfly hovering around my kale plants <laughs> and and oh, then I... it it literally mm -hmm. said to me i'm gonna lay my eggs here and you're not gonna touch them and i thought cheeky that's very cheeky um <laughs> And lo and behold, when I went out the next day, there were eggs on the kale, butterfly eggs. And I knew what was coming next. And I was like, oh, no, I can't destroy them. I couldn't do it because <laughs> the butterfly had literally spoken to me. Um, so I left them. And then obviously nature took its course. And then the next day or a couple of days after, I, I looked at my kale and it had been literally stripped back by all of these um caterpillars and i decided well kale's not so expensive i can just buy that from the supermarket and i just gave over all of my plants to the uh caterpillars and the butterflies uh so to help them because there's a bit of um let's say a shortage what's the word <laughs> that they're, they're becoming more rare because of all the pesticides and things that a lot of people use on their gardens and butterflies and um they are um like messengers from the fairy realm sometimes fairies can kind of shape shift into that or use that um uh the form of the butterfly to, so it could have been like a fairy talking to me in the body of the butter who who knows but they're very closely connected because insects are an intrinsic part of nature so it figures that there will be a connection with fairies there too mm. no that sounds yeah no i agree with that i don't agree with the kale however i find it i personally not on board with the whole kale situation <laughs> i i I, I've tried kale. I've tried it in a variety. Of, I've tried to smother it in things, and it still doesn't taste good. So I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I, I would have happily handed it over to the butterfly. <laughs> well, the thing is, because I'm I uh, have a plant-based diet. I don't eat any flesh, any meat, or any fish. So kale mm. is one of the most protein-filled oh, vegetables, okay. and I do actually like the taste of it. So, and it's not for everybody. It's quite bitter because it's i grow black kale so it's even more bitter and it's darker and it's like but i know that i'm getting so much goodness from it so i, I actually really enjoy it i just steam it with onions and tomatoes and things and it's quite it's lovely i, I really enjoy it but yeah i know it's not everybody's cup of tea so mm. to speak <laughs> but yeah great butterflies can have more kale they'll be very happy <laughs> I didn't think kale could get worse, and then you just told me there's a black version. I'm sorry, but just, <laughs> I just like, you just took it to the next level. Like, but if you love butterflies, I want to tell you about something that happened on my honeymoon with butterflies. Um, mm. uh, we went to a little island called Vidara Island, which is up in the wet Sundays um, off Airlie Beach in off the Queensland coast, and. Um, I was, we were trekking, it was a very small island, and I was trekking from one side of the island to the other side, which is yeah. about an hour walk. And um, when you get to the very top, I got told by um, the, um, the maid or, or one, one of the people there in the resort said, when you get to the top of the island, you just have to kind of, you know, stand still, hold your arms out and close your eyes and just wait. 
and I'm thinking, oh, this sounds like somebody's going to come and mug me or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got up to the top and I did exactly what they said. And within like a minute, I was surrounded with butterflies. And I was just, and they just went round and round and round me for, for ages and just completely enclosed. And it, apparently this, this island, the Gara, is, is a habitat for a, a, a particular species. And, um, and they actually have, they had a gentleman, I met him on the way back down after, after this happened, but it was the most amazing experience. Um, so if you're into butterflies, you should go to Badara Island and check that out. It was oh, just wow. a... Oh, mm. wow. That, that sounds like heaven to me. And the idea of something like that happening uh, is so, I love it when, when just one butterfly lands on me. So let alone being surrounded by that many, that sounds like a very wonderful experience i'd love that and and that's you know i think you have got like a, a connection to fairies you know listening to you and all your stories and the things that you're saying so i think i think you'll find that they they'll that you'll have more experiences after this show as well i think i believe that <laughs> thanks for that What is the most common sign that there's a fairy in the vicinity? Oh, OK. The most common sign. OK, so the first thing that's coming to mind is, oh, do you have um, dandelion flowers over there? You know, they call them fairy clocks where you blow them and all the little seeds. So that is a common sign. So if you see a little, I call them little fairy wishes, that that's a sign that a fairy is nearby yes you can say it's also a sign that the wind has blown and it's the dandelion spreading its seed but that is a common sign of of a fairy or the presence of fairies also also another common sign is a fairy ring <laughs> which is a circle growing in the grass of mushrooms or toadstools in a ring in the shape of a ring and they're said to sprout up after fairies have been dancing there in a circle. So that that's a very common, quite a commonly known uh, thing as well, certainly within in the fairy community. So a fairy ring, fairy wishes also, um, and this is something, it's actually not common, commonly known at all, but it, it's certainly worth noting, is that most people have heard you know when a when an angel is nearby you'll see a white feather very often that's a sign of angels that's a very definite thing well fairies also leave feathers too just to confuse things <laughs> but generally the feathers that fairies will leave will be more kind of wild bird feathers so um you know it could be a, oh, i don't know what birds you have over there but like a jay feather a kind of corvid type feather or or an owl or something like this so fairies will work almost like um birds that are associated with shamanism shamanism so they will leave feathers so that is a sign as well because birds and fairies work together as well fairies will often hitch a ride on the back of a bird um so that's something to keep in mind so there are a few little signs uh again i don't want to say it's common because it might just be unique to me but certain smells sweet a sweet smell that is not explainable like you're in the middle of nowhere you get the smell of toffee apples there's something going on um and that's something that's been my personal experience as i explained earlier but you might have something that's more personal to you and then you do have to decipher, is that the smell of a, of a past somebody who's passed over coming back to say hello, an ancestor? You know, you, you will know if you really tune in and are, you know, sensitive to your own feelings and intuition, you'll be able to know. So you can get certain smells. Again, that's not always common, but the, but the common thing I would say is the fairy ring. That is the most common thing, a circle of toadstools, or mushrooms that spring up after the fairies have been there. So that is a sign that fairies are close. Mm. Do they have anything to do with truffles? 
Um, I would have thought that's all connected isn't it they grow in the same way i don't know too much about truffles but i know that they grow in the same way as um as toadstools and mushrooms don't they do yes. they have the spores yes i was just wondering if maybe that's a different type of fig of the fay that kind of because you'd want to you'd want to hook up with that one wouldn't you so. <laughs> <laughs> well there's your starting point there is your starting point there will be fairies associated with truffles because it's something that grows as part of nature so fairies are associated with everything that grows every single thing that grows there will be a fairy energy working with it got like the guardian of nature they're guardians of nature nature angels earth angels you can call them label them whatever you want but there will be a particular fairy that whose sole job it is is to protect that particular plant truffle mushroom toadstool whatever it is so yeah yeah definitely well that's all for our podcast thanks for listening and remember if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.